Okay, um, welcome everybody um, to this afternoon's panel. Journalism after Snowden, uh, nearly three years since those um, particularly stunning revelations, and I think I'm happy to say never more relevant <laughs> than today. Uh, we have a fantastic panel of um, experts here uh, who we're going to spend the next um, hour and a half uh, in discussion with. Something, uh, sort of one of the things I want to say about the session uh, is I'm going to give each of the panelists a chance to kind of make some opening remarks. This is a very hot room and people tend to, their sort of energy levels tend to drop, particularly after lunch. So what I'm going to propose is that if you have questions after we've heard in introduc introductory remarks to kind of raise your hand at any point because I think that sort of, you know, there are probably kind of journalists and students and educators in the room who will all have interesting things to ask. So instead of waiting right till the end, I'm sure we can s talk among ourselves for at least an hour and a half, probably more. But that's uh, to say that first off, which is if you, if you want to ask a question, um, just put your hand in the air um, once, we've, uh, once we've heard from each of our panelists. Um, so uh, just to introduce um, our panel, um, to my immediate right and actually watching the West Ham Arsenal game, which is really distracting because he is a West Ham fan and I'm an Arsenal fan, um, is uh, Char Charlie Beckett, who's a uh, director of uh, Polis at, uh, uh, is that what you are now? You have so many titles, the director of Polis at uh, the London School of Economics. Um, to my immediate left is my old colleague and terrific uh, uh, investigative journalist, um, Ewan McCaskill, who, uh, for those that, how many people here have seen Citizen Four? Who, who literally has, I think, the best line in uh, Citizen Four when he's um, first interrogating uh, Edward Snowden. Um, and then to his left, we have uh, uh, investigative journalist uh, Stefania Marizzi, who um, works here in Italy. You all know her work from uh, La, La Repubblica and Espresso. Um, and then on uh, the end, somebody else, uh, Marcel Rosenbach, who is a journalist and author, uh, works for De Spiegel, who, a little bit like uh, uh, Ewan is a veteran of this type of story, was involved in WikiLeaks. Uh, sorry, uh, the veteran word is always horrible, isn't it? It doesn't mean old, Marcel, it just means yeah, experience. Just experience. Um, uh, WikiLeaks, but also has been, it was very he heavily involved in um, the uh, uh, NSA um, stories as well. Uh, and we thought that we would actually, I'm going to start with Ewan because he was right at the centre of that story, but also he's been pretty busy in the last week or two as well with his byline on a, on a few of the um, Panama Papers uh, stories. And we thought we could um, disrupt this panel by both looking at what's happened um, to investigative reporting and security reporting and technology since Snowden, but also use it as an opportunity to talk about the biggest story in the world right now, which is the, the Panama Papers leak. So Ewan, um, over to you. Uh, just sort of, you know, w we said, how would you frame kind of both what's happened in the last couple of weeks and also what's happened over the last couple of years and how do you tie it back to that first meeting you had with um, Edward Snowden um, in back in Hong Kong in 2013? Um, you have to press it. Yeah. There you go. Um, I, I wasn't centrally involved in the Panama Papers. Um, some of my colleagues have been working on it at, for six uh, months. I just came into it in the last few weeks. The uh, deputy editor, Paul Johnson, asked me to review all the stories. Uh, and then earlier this week, Monday and Tuesday, I was writing a uh, reaction to the uh, Panama Papers. And on Tuesday night, uh, he said, you know, that's a good story. Uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron dangerously exposed by information about his family links to um, offshore trusts. And he says, you'll do the same tomorrow. And I says, no, I'm going to Perugia. Uh, <laughs> so I was pretty unpopular on Tuesday night. But I'm glad I'm here anyway. Uh, the... Um, When uh, I was involved in the WikiLeaks 
uh, story. I was based in America at the time, and I did the WikiLeaks uh, uh, papers related to uh, the US, and also the ones about China, because our China correspondent, uh, it was too dangerous for our China correspondent to do it. Uh, Marcel was also involved in WikiLeaks. And at the time, we thought, this is as good as it gets. We're never going to get a leak on this scale ever again. And then a few years later, <coughs> along comes Snowden. And we get another fantastic leak. And again, you think, this is a one-off. We're not going to get leaks like this again. Um, and if I be really believed that, it'd be totally depressing, and I would have just given up journalism at that point. But I have to believe that there's going to be more stories like that. And along comes the Panama Papers, which is a huge impact all around the world. Um, and it's because it's so easy now for whistleblowers, uh, because you can take a memory stick, you can download all this data, and there's, I believe there's going to be a lot more stories like this, that there are a lot more whistleblowers, um, and that I hope they, they will come to The Guardian and Der Spiegel and whoever. Um, one of the things that emerged from the... I met Edward Snowden in Hong Kong along with Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras. And one of the things that emerged almost by accident was the creation of journalistic alliances. Um, just at a personal level, I'm a traditional newspaper reporter. Uh, Glenn was a blogger. Laura Poitras was a filmmaker. We had different skills, but we complemented one another and worked together as a team. The NSA is one of the most powerful organizations in the world. Uh, the British equivalent, GCHQ. Uh, the combination of the NSA, GCHQ, probably the two most powerful uh, intelligence organizations in the world. Uh, you sort of probably get counterparts in Russia and China, but still powerful organizations taking on the intelligence agencies at any time is a difficult uh, proposition. And one of the joys of working in that story was the way to counter that was by forming alliances with other um, news organizations. One of the most important was De Marcel and Der Spiegel, um, who were in almost from the start because uh, Laura Poitras was based in Berlin. The Guardian came under huge pressure from the British government and they eventually they were threatened to close down a reporting in the UK, threatened to prosecute us. We had to move our operation to uh, uh, New York. We were working from the Guardian's New York office. And uh, then the British government said uh, that uh, even though you're in New York, you're still part of uh, British jurisdiction. So we had then to move to the New York Times, and the New York Times became part of this alliance. Um, in the UK, uh, the British government ordered the destruction of all the computers, hard drives, uh, anything associated with Snowden, all had to be destroyed in the Guardian basement. Um, I was told this by, uh, I was based in New York at the time, and the US editor, Janine Gibson, came back and told me that they'd had to destroy the uh, Guardian computers uh, under the eyes of two officials from GCHQ. And I thought Janine was making it up. You know, the idea that Britain in the 21st century, the government officials would be overseeing the destruction of uh, journalistic uh, material. Um, I was waiting for the punchline and it never came. The, and that alliance grew. So we had uh, the Guardian, the Spiegel, um, Laura was working her documentary, Washington Post were doing stories, Glenn spoke to El Globo in Brazil, uh, we, uh, we, Pro 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 Publica you have. we had yeah. ProPublica yeah. became involved, uh, ABC, Australian TV, and so it was a, this huge network, um, and that's almost like a precursor for what's happened with the Panama Papers. Um, in the Panama Papers, we've had uh, 400 journalists from 106 news organizations. 
around the world, and they've been working together for anything from six months to a year. Um, and again, because each country, they have specialized knowledge, and I think because of the nature of that alliance, the impact of the Panama Papers is much more powerful uh, than it would have been uh, without, if it had only been a handful or one organization involved. Um, the other great thing about this is uh, they've learned about source protection, uh, the use of encryption and uh, encrypted chat, encrypted uh, uh, platforms is now sort of normal. And it, they, they used it throughout the Panama Papers. <coughs> and what's amazing is you've had 400 journalists uh, working for the best part of a year and nothing leaked. Uh, the idea, you know, no journalists gossiped about this. The one leak was in Iceland just a few days before the main publication. But in the end, it didn't matter. That story grew in Iceland and uh, <coughs> built up steam. And then the last point, I was at a panel this morning with Emily and others, and they were talking mainly about Google and Facebook and uh, the, the lack of uh, sourcing um, for traditional uh, journalism or sourcing for news. And uh, part of the conversation was about <coughs> Facebook wants videos and BuzzFeed were talking about the tactics to attract an audience. And one of the things BuzzFeed have done recently was to blow up a watermelon. Um, and this has got a huge number of uh, hits. Um, the Panama Papers shows that hard news still matters. I mean, people are say skeptical about it and say, well, that's not what audiences want. Uh, that's not clickbait. But I think that Panama Papers shows there's still an audience for uh, hard news. The Guardian this week, I haven't seen the figures for traffic, but I know that we had 20 million views of the Panama Papers. Wow. 20 million views. And also, the Prime Minister of Iceland has never resigned over an exploding watermelon, <laughs> to my knowledge. Um, you and th thank you very much. Um, Marcel, uh, Tell us a little bit about, first of all, um, you know, De Spiegel um, did a fantastic job on the reporting of the NSA leaks. You also did some great explanatory reporting around it. You know, you made videos explaining the story. You were kind of did a, a great way of sort of socializing it. But also Germany, you know, it, it feels as though the NSA leaks had a, a kind of a profound effect on, you know, the German sort of public debate around this as well. So tell us a bit about, Bert, first of all, the process around these stories, what you think has changed, but also what, what it's done to the broader political atmosphere. Um, well, uh, thank you, uh, first of all, for having me on this panel. Um, and um, yeah, well, at least we tried to, to do explanatory pieces because we felt that the subject uh, actually is very abstract. Uh, it's non-sensual. It's really difficult to grasp. Uh, not only for us journalists, but uh, for a wider audience as well. And so we were thinking about different narratives and different ways to actually show the significance and relevance of the topic, which is still actually a challenge as of today, and I'm happy for ideas uh, uh, if you have any in the audience. So what we try to actually do is to show actual victims, which is easily being said, but in reality rather difficult to do because uh, if you think about it, those people that have been targeted, they have been uh, victimized once already by the surveillance and they were of course very hesitant when they when we approached them and asked them to show their face and tell their stories um, so luckily enough uh, some of them were ready to do that uh, uh, I'm thinking of a German company uh, called Stellar we, we went there uh, uh, spoke to engineers uh, uh, showed them uh, documents that were uh, outlining how they were hacked uh, even showing their their personal passwords uh, being in the documents. Uh, and you could actually, we went there with a video camera and we, we saw that made a big difference in actually showing the, the reactions of the people who were very self-conscious in the beginning and saying this, you know, uh, like m not much harm can, could have been done. And you see how they react when they saw how deep the, the um, actual uh, uh, hack went and what actually was possible. Uh, for the five eyes uh, by, by doing this hack. Mm -hmm. 
Um, overall, the impact of, of the revelations, uh, re let me start on the positive note and then getting more and more uh, in the, to the depressing side of things. <laughs> uh, on the positive note, I would say it's really uh, uh, mm. a, a, an achievement that we have an ongoing conversation on such a difficult topic like surveillance pretty much since uh, three years, uh, it will be in June. Right. And um, I wouldn't have expected that, actually, if you would ask me in the beginning of the uh, revelation. So that's a positive achievement. I think uh, uh, on other positive uh, results and lessons learned, uh, we have seen judicial acts, verdicts, findings by court, be it in the US, be it on the EU level, that wouldn't have been possible without right. the uh, Snowden revelations. And coming to actually another point, which is can't be overstated, I think, in the relevance, is how business actually reacted. I think in many ways business uh, uh, reacted as a kind of catalyst uh, 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 and affected actually many people's lives. Take uh, WhatsApp, the latest uh, uh, example, if you think that WhatsApp being uh, now with Facebook uh, actually went to open whisper systems and uh, uh, now uh, included end-to-end -end encryption and I know there are many topics to be raised and many questions to be asked but that actually affects a billion or more people that are now using end-to-end -end encryption without even knowing it, without even uh, having to download something especially. And this is, uh, I think, uh, a major result. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about the um, uh, Apple FBI uh, uh, standoff we've seen, I don't think that would have been uh, possible. If you think about companies like Microsoft now, building clouds in Europe because of fear, of course, uh, of loss of customers, but on the other hand, that's a direct result. Having said that, uh, the political debate, uh, and now I'm coming to the, uh, perhaps uh, 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 to down a little bit, <laughs> um, the political debate clearly has shifted and one has to be blind not to see that and not to actually acknowledge that the political debate went a complete other turn and um, uh, and that actually, uh, for me, started actually with Ukraine. Um, uh, it made a big step with, with ISIS and, of course, uh, the terrorist atrocities we saw then in, in, in Paris and, and, and Belgium. And that is something, actually, um, that is uh, true not only with uh, this, uh, this round of national security reporting and reporting about privacy and, and uh, data protection, but with former cases as well. The narrative, uh, again, is, is uh, very strong and it's really interesting because we're still debating this uh, between, um, between um, on freedom, on the other hand, and security. Uh, right. And I don't think that's the right way to coin it because, uh, as I see it, is it's freedom uh, versus the promise of more security. Because what we actually, actually see is that even if you are able to intercept communications, and this goes all the way back, uh, even before 9-11, uh, that doesn't mean that you actually can prevent terrorist uh, attacks from, from happening. And so I think this is really uh, uh, something that at least mm. uh, uh, is in my head, and uh, I try to find um, solutions for it, how to find a counter-narrative to this uh, easy win we still see on the side of uh, law enforcement, national security interests in this debate. Right, um, in fact, we may talk uh, in, a, in a bit about the um, UK and the Investigatory Powers yeah. Act, which yeah. is, somebody said, uh, to a lawyer said to me the other day, it's as uh, Mark Stevens said, it's as though the British government looked at everything that um, Edward Snowden revealed and said, oh, that looks like a really good <laughs> idea, let's actually turn it into a law. Um, so we, we'll come back to that. Stefania, um, tell us about your, um, reporting for L'Espresso on this, and particularly, uh, you know, y y y like Marcel and um, mm. Ewan, but perhaps even more so, you were often directly contradicting things that the government was saying about <laughs> there. Tell us, tell us a bit about that process. And yes, <laughs> so, first of all, thank you for inviting me on this panel, and um, just, uh, just want to, to <coughs> uh, explain a bit my work, I start the covering uh, WikiLeaks, uh, starting involving WikiLeaks and uh, uh, leaks uh, in 2009, and that was because one of my sources had been crashed <laughs> two years before this, and so I was really determined to understand how I could protect my sources. 
figure right. out to protect my communications with my sources. And that was my main concern. And that ultimately put WikiLeaks on my radar screen because I, I felt the duty, the professional duty to, do, to find a solution, at, at least to try mm, right. to see how I could protect my sources in an effective way because I feel responsible in first person. You know, I cannot accept that people say, well, they are adults, so they know about their choices, so you, do, you don't have to care about what they do, whether they, they, hoped, that they hoped for talking to you, it's uh, their matter. I, I disagree with, with this approach. So I discovered this organization in 2008 uh, when no one was uh, looking at WikiLeaks. Uh, WikiLeaks right. had been established just two years before that. Yeah. So no one knew. And at the beginning, I was very, very suspicious about them. I thought it could be an intelligence operation. So I, I and I'm very anti-intelligence uh, for, first of all, for my human experience. Before journalism, I, I got a degree in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So I have seen many of my colleagues going to the security, national security establishment, working for NATO, working for, uh, in general, for security services oh. or uh, defense services. So I was, I, I'm still very anti-intelligence <laughs> um, services, though of course I, I realize that you cannot generalize. Uh, you cannot generalize because if you, if you say, all intelligence services guys are uh, bad guys, so you cannot work on Snowden files, you cannot <laughs> work on Chelsea Manning files and so on. So I started um, getting involved in this um, on leaks uh, in uh, 2008, started working with them in 2009 and covered everything, work on uh, Afghan war logs, cables, and uh, Gitmo files, whatever. And when Snowden came out, uh, I immediately understood the, the, the importance of this revelation because that was the first time we could have a deep inside, deep inside uh, uh, an agency like the N National Security Agency. Uh, what made me understand the, the, the importance, of course, the fact that for the first time, we had access to top secret files. We could mm -hmm. access actual documents, and we could that uh, we can under we could understand the full extent of the sa state surveillance uh, state surveillance uh, society. I mean, we are in this kind of society since 2001, 2002. I think one of the tricks was to put inside these societies uh, using secrecy, so mm -hmm. there was no debate, no public debate about this. Mm -hmm. And most of all, they made us uh, uh, quite comfortable with surveillance because they made surveillance uh, like a, a kind of fun. You go on social network, you start revealing your life, you start revealing your stuff, you put the, the, the pictures of your loved one. Can you imagine if that was not a fun, uh, what kind of reaction we could have been? I, I would have, I could have imagined people very uncomfortable with putting mm -hmm. their life on the social network right. picture and things like that. I think they found a way to make the surveillance state in a, a quite a bit a pleasure, a fun, a kind of, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I think it was a, yeah. a smart tragedy, I mean, a smart strategy. I don't know. Um, I cannot imagine people really happy to reveal their <laughs> inner... Uh, but you know what? what you more should live with my teenage children. <laughs> They're very happy to reveal absolutely, <laughs> absolutely everything about absolutely, their lives, uh, even uh, even when I point it out to them and I say, you know, because of Edward Snowden, that Snapchat can be seen by the police. At which point they look slightly uncomfortable. But yes, yeah, you yeah, know, that, that uh, indeed, uh, it's absolutely. A but you know, at the same time, I don't believe to those people who try to say, well you are complicit of this state of surveillance because you put your life inside your right. social network. I don't think yeah. it's like, th I don't think uh, you, we have to think about this. I think we should realize that this machine is so huge mm. that there is, there is little we can do. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm quite skeptic about people saying, well, it is a matter of political reform. I'm not sure you can actually reform Leviathan, mm -hmm. a giant like the NSA, mm -hmm. they, ca they can blackmail the world. We published, a few weeks, weeks ago, we published the NSA interception about right. the 
Italy and about Berlusconi, and one of the closest advisors of Silvio Berlusconi, his man in Russia, Valentino Valentini. And uh, we at Nespresso realized the impact of this revelation because for the first time, politicians could read, the, uh, could read this interception. So that they had no, uh, th there was no way to deny <laughs> right. because they could write their interception. Interception is a big matter in Italy. Almost all of political scandals go mm. through interceptions. <laughs> Corruption, uh, mafia, and, and whatever goes through interception. So when they read this, when they read this interception, they were, they got paranoid. They realized that this agency can blackmail them for centuries because right. they are so corrupt <laughs> they <laughs> that basically the NSA can mm. blackmail for them for centuries. So I'm not sure whether we can mm. have effective political reform about this state of surveillance. I just, w just wanted to ask you one quick question, uh, Stefania, before um, moving to, to, to Charlie, and actually um, it's something I should have uh, asked you and, and Marcel as well, which is, so, you know, we're talking about this incredible story now, you know, in terms of the Panama mm -hmm. Papers, we have cross-border reporting, etc. But do you, do you feel that your work has become harder or easier in the three years since um, since Snowden, because lots of what you're saying suggests that it would be easier, but actually, you know, in the in the states in particular, there has definitely been, um, you know, people would say things have never been it's never been harder to report national security issues than it is now. Well, do you mean from the I mean from the point of uh, source protection? I mm. think it is harder because right. uh, you know. I started questioning whether I can actually protect sources, <laughs> really, because when you know the, the full extent of the yeah. state surveillance, you ask yourself, well, how can I manage this? If they can, you know, you have, you realize that for uh, that your email, your uh, mobile phone, e even encryption can be bypassed. Now, right no. now in Italy, they are discussing about using state Trojan to bypass encryption, right. and they want to approve a law. They are doing all they can to approve a, lo a law on, on state Trojan to bypass encryption. So how can I protect my source? I, I'm, really, uh, uh, I'm really obsessed by this question. I, I <laughs> I'm thinking night and day about mm -hmm. this, and I, you know, 99% of my sources are unable to protect their communication. I'm not mm -hmm. concerned about the sources who are able to protect their own communication. I know they, ha they have awareness, they have technical skills. I'm concerned about the 99% because I know that there is little I can do. And when I try to ad address this problem with my sources, they get scared. So right. they say, hmm, how can I, <laughs> how can I? And indeed, some of my colleagues tell me, please don't address this thing with your source, otherwise no one will, take to you, will talk to you anymore. <laughs> You know? <laughs> right, which yeah. is, that's a huge cultural uh, issue for news organizations, is which is how do you, because Edward Snowden himself says, I, there's, you know, I know so much about this stuff, I knew, you know, choosing to self-disclose was, he said it wasn't really that I had an option. You know, absolutely. it's like you, you, I knew that there was no chance. I was, I was surprised to even get out of the country in a Ab way. Absolutely. If you consider that data retention policies, you know, mm. you know data retention laws in, uh, in countries, yeah. uh, in European countries, I mean, in theory, they are illegal after mm. the European court, uh, court of Justice sentence. Mm. No? But <laughs> if you take uh, Italy and all the European countries, these data retention laws are still in place. So they can acquire journalists' metadata, which means who you call, at what time, uh, how many mm. minutes you spend on the phone, you are on the phone with sure. the source, uh, emails, when you mm. email. They can acquire journalists' metadata as yeah. they acquire drug, sma drug smugglers' mm. metadata. And no one is saying this. Right, right. That's a good point, actually, at which to switch to Charlie, who uh, you've both made a study of and, and written about um, WikiLeaks and written about the um, concept of network journalism before it really worked, and now it turns out you're right about all of that, so congratulations. Um, but also you, you see things through a policy framework as well and how, give, it, give us your kind of view of, first of all, sort of, you know, what, what does the progression of network journalism mean? And secondly, this big question of are we in a better or worse place uh, just in terms of protections and, and frameworks, etc. Well, first of all, I should say we're in 
<coughs> a much worse place than we were 45 minutes ago because the Arsenal are winning 2-0. Um, <laughs> but, um, as Emily said, uh, I wrote a book about WikiLeaks, which was called uh, News in the Networked Era, and it was inspired, in fact, by Emily, who uh, wrote a preface to it. And she asked a really good question uh, when WikiLeaks happened, which was, what are the lessons? What is WikiLeaks telling us about the rest of journalism? Uh, not, you know, WikiLeaks, obviously, fantastically exciting, uh, dramatic revelations, an extraordinary um, leader as well in Julian Assange. So that was very exciting. But I thought Emily asked a really good question back then, which was, which I tried to answer in the book at least, with a series of questions about what could we learn uh, uh, from WikiLeaks and that kind of whistleblowing journalism about the future of not just uh, whistleblowing uh, journalism, leak journalism, but about the idea of disruptive journalism. Um, so this is very much for me, it's kind of after Panama, after Snowden, but it's also uh, after uh, WikiLeaks. And in the book I said, you know, that, 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 that uh, the, the lesson for mainstream media was partly that it should be more uh, disruptive uh, Yasmin Alibi Brown used a great phrase a couple of days ago. Sh it should be more disloyal. You know, journalism mustn't forget that it isn't actually the servant uh, of power, uh, that it should take risks and it should challenge people in authority. And as WikiLeaks show, uh, the internet and uh, the allied, you know, social media and so on gave an extraordinary opportunity, partly as people have said, making leaking easier, but also making it um, phenomenally easier to spread uh, that information and make it public globally and allow people to, uh, to interact with it. Um, but what the other thought that came out of that book, I thought, well, you know, is WikiLeaks going to be sustainable? Uh, is it going to continue? And, of course, it has continued, although I think we'd all agree that it's demonstrated some real flaws. It had that advantage of not being located somewhere, it had the advantage of being this very independent uh, organization. But in a sense, that was also its weaknesses. So I'm very interested in how do the other media institutions sustain that kind of uh, disruptive journalism. And of course, I know institutions is a really boring word, um, but it's really, really important in quite a practical sense that journalism has some kind of institutional basis. Institutions are very good uh, at paying people, uh, they're very good at training people. They're very good at giving people uh, skills. Um, but uh, perhaps most important is that media institutions, like The Guardian, uh, for example, has an audience. It has a readership that's already there waiting uh, to pay attention to what you've got to say. And uh, to varying degrees, uh, they are trusted. They're somebody that you can leak to. I thought it was really interesting that you know, Ed Snowden made a very deliberate choice about who he was going to uh, leak to. Um, but it's very important that, as I say, those institutions do reach an audience because what is the point of shouting in an empty room? The whole point of journalism is that you want uh, to connect to people, not just to reveal things, but you hope uh, to change things. And this is so important, as again, people have mentioned in the context of the, the surveillance uh, debate that we're having. Um, and uh, I think it's also interesting how, of course, media institutions are adapting. As Emily said, I've talked about network journalism where there's more public participation, there's more interaction. And as uh, Ewan mentioned, what's fascinating is how when the Guardian uh, leaked the WikiLeaks um, information, they worked obviously with WikiLeaks, but also with other media institutions, and I think the Panama Papers has been absolutely fascinating and hugely impressive. How on earth do you involve all those hundreds of journalists and not leak the fact that you've got that leak? I think that in itself was amazing. But of course, working in that networked way with the, uh, uh, the other institutions has been significantly uh, empowering uh, for journalism. It means that the risk has been spread amongst those uh, different brands it meant that they were able to bring an extraordinary resource of skills, of journalistic interpretation, identifying the significance, and just translating, frankly, these very technical uh, documents and data 
into something meaningful, into real uh, stories. And of course, don't forget the packaging. You know, the fact that these uh, news organizations have the skills to present this information, you know, data visualizations, the writing, the pictures, in a way, again, that helps to communicate and, and reach that audience and engage them. And so I think the Panama Papers were fascinating because of that collaborative effort. But we also see more generally that there are lots of different kinds of institutions out there now. And I think in that sense, I, I, I wouldn't say a golden age of investigative journalism, but it's certainly a really interesting, fertile period where you have the mainstream organizations like The Guardian or the BBC uh, working together and working in new ways. But also we have these other new kinds of institutions like uh, ProPublica, you know, partly foundation-funded independent uh, journalism. You have uh, philanthropist-funded journalism. You know, that's what Mr. Uh, Glenn Greenwald relies on. You know, he, he is paid uh, largely out of the profits from, it's eBay, isn't it? It is eBay. eBay, yeah. indeed. Sort of beautiful irony there, I think. Uh, and then, of course, um, you have the other independents. In, in Italy, uh, there's the, the network of investigative journalists who've worked with people in Italy, but also internationally on their uh, stories around uh, international mafia, for example. And of course, you know, we still have, uh, you know, the good old mainstream media plugging away. And I think this is really interesting and important that there is this collaboration, not just for practical reasons, but I think it um, generates more creativity because I, I was a journalist before, but I was never a classic investigative journalist like these people. Um, but I was very conscious that investigative journalists can be a kind of culture to themselves. They're kind of weird people. Um, you know, they want to do something that other people don't want them to do. And they're very dogged, and even when their editors are saying there's nothing here, they keep going. Uh, so they're kind of strange folk, and they have a kind of mystical culture often. And um, that is fantastic, but I don't want that kind of disruptive investigative journalism to become like a little a niche. I don't want it to be a little national park on its own. I think it's really important that it remains uh, blended into, networked into all other kinds of uh, journalism institutions. It should always be uh, part of the DNA of journalism overall. And this is, you know, again, uh, perhaps it's the obvious, but we are in an era where there is so much data and people in power, organizations that have authority, they now operate through data, through information. And so it's vital that we are able to access that even when they don't want us uh, to do that because that is how we reveal how power works in the way. Um, but we should never forget while we're thinking of those you know, technical issues, those legal issues, those policy issues, we should never forget that sort of fundamental purpose, which is to be disloyal and to serve the public, uh, not those in power. Thank you very much, Charlie. I actually made a mistake at the beginning of the panel. It's only an hour, not an hour and a half. So if you have questions, put your hands up, because uh, we, we, we'll, um, we'll take questions uh, now. But I want to sort of come back, if you like, to this end of the panel as well and sort of pick up on... Um, a couple of things about uh, just that we were talking about the, the, the Investigatory Powers Act in the UK, which is effectively saying the government will, you know, be able to pretty much spy on everything that you're doing and will have legal. Uh, now, I mean, so, so there's a question here for, 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 for journalism, I think, in particular, which is, is it in a way better that we know all of this? As Stefania was saying, you know, now we know that essentially all of these systems are unreliable you know a lot of our trade totally relies on being able to extract secret information uh, protect people who will tell us things that they don't want other people to know you know what's the kind of is it is it is I, d I don't want to say the investigatory powers act is a good thing I'm just saying do we think that that's you know I think Marcel you said that th this is sort of you know this is just going to happen now you know we can't we can't is, is, the, is the remedy for this to know it all and try and go round the edges, as we always have as journalists, or is there something else we should be doing? Want to? The, uh, when Snowden uh, started, uh, the attitude of the British government was that the existing legislation is fine. Um, 
And if you looked at the British legislation at the time, it was totally vague. It was so vague it allowed the intelligence agencies basically to do whatever they wanted. It was written in an ambiguous way. Um, the Investigatory Powers Act, uh, which is going through Parliament at present, it's in some ways it's a tribute to Edward Snowden because it lays out all the powers that intelligence agencies uh, have. Um, it, it, it says that the intelligence agencies are, have the power to hack. Uh, basically, they, they, don't, they don't like the phrase mass surveillance. They prefer bulk data collection. Um, but this investigatory powers bill allows them to do that. So it lists, um, Snowden has forced the British government to put their hands up and say, yes, uh, we do have all these powers. Um, the depressing side of this is the fact that they've made absolutely no concession whatsoever uh, to the revelations in the Snowden. Uh, it may be, in, in Germany there was a huge debate. In America there's been a huge debate. In Britain, there hasn't. Uh, it may be because people in Britain feel satisfied. Maybe they don't feel under threat. Maybe security is more important to them than privacy. But we had two problems at the start of the Snowden story. One was that most of the British press didn't report it. Uh, the, I love the BBC, but it was totally cowardly over uh, Snowden. Uh, Richard Sambrook, who's a former uh, director of news at the BBC, he's at this um, festival. Uh, he said that if Snowden had come to the BBC, the BBC wouldn't have run the stories. Uh, the papers like The Times, The Telegraph, The Mail, The Sun, after the initial day, totally ignored it as a story. So if you lived in Britain, and unless you were reading The Guardian, you wouldn't be aware of this. And as the BBC is the main source of news in the UK, uh, their failure to report this. So it was lost. Um, and there's also the attitude in Britain where people basically think the intelligence services, um, they think it's James Bond. The intelligence agencies are all sort of cuddly figures in bow ties and drinking martinis. Uh, <laughs> they don't think of it in terms of their ability to enter into uh, almost every aspect of life. Um, so yes, we have this bill that sets out all their powers, but it, it hasn't made a single concession. Uh, I'm totally opposed to uh, mass surveillance, bulk data collection. I'm not opposed to intelligence services. I believe in the tailored surveillance, um, but there's absolutely no concession on this whatsoever. Sure. Yeah, if I may add one thing, the legislation side of things is, is one thing. Uh, the other thing that actually you were asking, is life harder as a, as a, a journalist uh, now? The other thing uh, that is actually uh, interesting, I think, it's a direct uh, criminalization of, of leakers and uh, whistleblowers and um, uh, even journalists. I mean, you see here now in the words of uh, uh, American authorities, accomplices of Snowden. So that was like uh, journalists working with the Snowden materials were framed uh, by American authorities. And interestingly enough, I mean, I mean uh, this criminalization of, of uh, whistleblowers uh, started not with uh, Snowden, but uh, earlier on. And we have uh, now prominent cases, like the cases of Will, uh, Will uh, Bin Binney, we have uh, Thomas Drake. Uh, and others, yeah. and uh, Snowden knew the cases very well. He knew the case of Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, uh, uh, who went to jail for 35 years. Um, um, so he knew that, and uh, in with the full, full knowledge, uh, he acted uh, as he acted. And that, uh, in a way, I think sends an interesting message because this, this strategy of setting a precedent, setting a deterrent, in a way, obviously didn't work. We have had whistleblowers uh, since then, very recent cases, big cases, yeah. uh, smaller cases. And so from a strategic level, I think uh, this is an interesting lesson to learn that uh, I hope uh, the authorities that are actually pursuing this politics and this strategy learn from it mm -hmm. as well. But 
I so, think so that's a really interesting point and I mean there are two, two questions um, uh, which is first of all sort of institutionally have you changed what you do as journalism institutions or individuals in terms of how you attract or you know signal to whistleblowers I mean you know it's interesting that Edward Snowden knew everything about the coverage and the previous whistleblowers and the leakers and he was on Twitter commenting pretty quickly after the Panama Papers about you know the courage of the person who come forward it's also interesting that when it's corporate secrets of wrongdoing, um, you know, governments fall, and it will be interesting to see whether the whistleblower, should the whistleblower ever be disclosed, suffers any really sort of, you know, kind of re reprisal for that. Because, uh, and what Snowden might say, or we might say on his behalf, is that actually what he told us was true. You know, that he, and, and, and this idea that he was compromising national security was he was also revealing things which were extensions or overreach of power. So what's our kind of, first of all, what do we do to um, carry on attracting uh, whistleblowers? And secondly, you know, there's a, what's our kind of long-term moral duty to our sources in these, in these cases? Because I know that's something you know, you'll all have thought about, particularly in, you know, relation to Snowden, who's a very visible, um, vulnerable person. I don't know who wants to do it. Stefania, do you want to have a go at that? Okay. Well, I think people, uh, civil society start to understand that basically um, these people are revealing information in the public interest. They, they are not spies. They are not... Uh, <laughs> they are not uh, uh, informants, they are not, uh, you know, th these people are taking huge, ri huge risk to, to reveal information in the public interest. And I think this is the key, revealing information in the public interest. And not, uh, um, you know, at the beginning, I have seen in uh, these last seven years of my work with WikiLeaks, uh, I have experienced all sorts of uh, attacks. Uh, I have witnessed <laughs> all sorts of attacks against these these guys. Uh, they were uh, attacked as criminal for revealing this information, as uh, uh, irresponsible. All sorts of attacks. But now I think people start understanding what's going on. They they, they start understanding that basically these people are revealing information in the public um, in the public interest, and, and they are in uh, confined. They are in prison. They are in exile. Let's not forget this. I mean, uh, Edward Snowden is basically in Russia, he's uh, <laughs> in exile. Uh, Chelsea Manning is in prison, 35 years, for revealing the horror, horror of the war in Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, the Gitmo files. Julian Assange is arbitrarily detained in the embassy. I mean, this is what the UN <laughs> ruled, basically. I'm not saying he's detained, it is the UN. Can you imagine? the editor-in-chief of Le Monde arbitrarily detained <laughs> in an embassy. Can you imagine this? Why is no, is nothing is happening? I mean, can mm. you imagine? I think those are, that, uh, so we had a um, question there and then one at the front. So if we get, oh, two questions there. Um, so if I can take those two first, then this one, then come back up there, thanks. Can you just say Hi. who you are as well? Yeah, I'm uh, Davide Vidovisi. Uh, working in the communication field. Um, I wonder why um, um, a whistleblower should reveal uh, its information after the, the story of uh, Edward Snowden, uh, after the story of Chelsea Manning, and so on. I mean, um, do you have any regrets after um, uh, seeing what happened uh, in, in, in um, Snowden, uh, Snowden's story? I mean, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Should you advise in, in another way, uh, it was not uh, after he wanted actually to uh, discover himself, uh, I don't know. Okay, that's, I mean, you and, yeah, I've heard you speak really movingly about this, about just sort of, you know, kind of preparing him for what life as a, as a, as a, a leaker or a whistleblower might be like, so it's a good question, which is, do you have any regrets or? The, the only regret I have in the coverage of uh, Snowden is that uh, we didn't do enough to protect uh, Edward, Edward Snowden. Um, at the time, 
the idea of he didn't want to remain anonymous. And e even if he'd wanted to, he couldn't have remained anonymous. By the time we met him in Hong Kong, uh, I think uh, we met first, uh, Glenn and Laura met him on the Monday, I met him on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we're sitting in this hotel room at the Mira Hotel, and uh, he realized that the uh, NSA police had visited his uh, home in Hawaii and spoken to his girlfriend. So even at that point, the NSA had an idea that they might have a problem with Snowden. So he, he, one, he didn't want to remain anonymous, and B, he, uh, he couldn't have, even if he'd wanted to. Now, um, early on, uh, I was asked about this last night, Sarah Harrison was talking about uh, Snowden, and Laura said to me, uh, what is the Guardian going to do to protect uh, Snowden? Now, we've never been in a situation like this. This isn't like a normal news story where you've got bits of the furniture that you've dealt with before. It was kind of, it was, a lot of it was unprecedented. And uh, I spoke to the editor, Alan Rusbridger, and said, you know, how can we help Snowden? And our expectation, and Snowden's expectation, was that he would remain in Hong Kong and uh, fight extradition. Um, and we spoke about would, pay, would we pay his hotel bills. If we pay his hotel bills, are you tainting a source? Are you, um, if we pay his legal fees, are we tainting a source? Uh, I think in the end we would have done those things. Uh, but WikiLeaks came in and spirited them off, hope, hoping to go to Ecuador and uh, he ended up in Moscow. Now, the short answer to what you, your question, um, even if we thought we should have done more for Edward Snowden, I don't think there's anything more we could have done. He's ended up by accident or design in the only country in the world where he's safe. Um, if he'd ended up in Ecuador, they would have sent a they would have put diplomatic or economic pressure on Ecuador, or they would have sent a CIA hit squad in to kidnap him as it did in Rome 10 years ago. Um, the, I can't think of a single country in the world where he would have been safe. If he, if, if he was in Europe, most European countries would have handed him over in, uh, in seconds. So by accident, he's ended up in Russia. My one worry is that when Snowden loses his propaganda, value five years, uh, Putin or whoever's in charge in Russia uh, might do a prisoner swap for um, a Russian held in American jail. I doubt if that will happen. Um, sorry, there was a second question just there as well. Thanks. Hi, I'm Paul Ganin. I'm with Al Jazeera English. Uh, my question is really two questions. <laughs> the first part is are we witnessing a radicalization of the technical class? I, I mean, uh, Stefania was talking about like how she's a mathematician, as, well, she's a journalist, she's not a source, uh, but 99% of her sources don't know how to protect themselves. So I, we see more people like Assange, Snowden, etc. Uh, they all come from a very technical background. And linked to that is that a case, we spoke with Julian Assange a couple of days ago, and he said, for example, in the Panama Leaks case, it, it's not, it wasn't a surprise that the leak actually happened in Germany, and the, like the source went to SC, because actually journalists in Germany are more educated on the technical side than in other countries in the world. So how is, how is technical education important for journalists in this era, era of journalism? And uh, is the technical class radicalizing? And if they don't, will we, that, will we have any leaks at all? Okay, those are great questions. Um, Stefania, do you want to help us out? Yeah. Well, I think the <coughs> technical aspect is more and more important. And I hope that this geek community, technical community, will 
uh, we'll build more user-friendly tools because <laughs> that's the real importance. I mean, uh, if I check in 15 years, uh, in 15 years of my profession, never ever met a colleague using encryption, never have a met a colleague protecting communication. The, the approach is really, really <laughs> upsetting. I mean, they, they don't perceive this as a threat. They think, well, we journalists are supposed to protect source. And when I ask them, how do you think you can protect source if you don't use, if you don't even try to use secure communication? I mean, but the problem, uh, uh, the problem, I think, is not only about journalists, it's also about sources. Because, you know, this is a uh, two-way process. Journalism developed through human interaction, and human interactions require communication. So the, 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 the <laughs> security aspect is not only about the, the journalists, it's also about the sources. The sources need, to, sources need to be aware that when they call us, when they reach us through an email, that metadata will nail us forever, forever. There is, there is no way. Last week, I read that the, the basically the Süddeutsche um, Zeitung journalists apparently destroyed the computers and uh, telephones they used during the Panama Papers. Well, <laughs> I'm happy that they do that, but you know, there's no way to destroy metadata. Once you have created metadata, there is no way to destroy them. You know. Metadata are our enemies. Metadata are our, our enemies. And when it comes to metadata, the only winning move is not to create them. So we have to find a way to have user-friendly tools, which cannot be telephones, which cannot be more emails, because these technologies go back to the 19th century, when the problem was not the state surveillance, you know? Uh, as, as far as your uh, second question is concerned, uh, are, the <laughs> are the technical class more radicalized? I think it is not about being radical. I think it is about being aware of what is happening. You know? People is, uh, there is no way to deny what the, the, the Snowden files are revealing. It is not about paranoia. We have the documents, I mean. No one can deny what these documents are. No one tried to say these documents are fake documents, are false. I mean, the state surveillance is reality. It's not a paranoia, dystopian, whatever. Marcel, the, the Germans uh, have a reputation for being more um, technically, technically literate. I have to say that on the Panama Papers, I was very pleased that uh, Columbia Journalism School, we started teaching data very seriously, uh, you know, five years ago or so. Uh, four, of, four or five of the journalists involved in the I ICIJ had come out of our programs, and also I don't think we would have taught digital security. Um, no journalism schools taught digital security four years ago. Now that's changing. Does it check? Does it? Are the skills changing in your newsroom as well? Are you sort of now thinking we have to, this is actually a core competence? Well, I think actually it's in the best interest of every journalist to actually educate themselves in uh, uh, operational security for journalists, if you want to uh, uh, mm. uh, coin it that way, because uh, as you have already mentioned, the, the example of Edward Snowden, who actually uh, decided to, that he wanted to work with Glenn Greenwald. Uh, uh, mm. I've said that before here on, uh, on another panel, but Glenn always missed the scoop of his life because he didn't uh, uh, use PGP at that time and you can't expect a source so committed to one journalist or blogger that he even go to the lengths to make a video tutorial like Edward Snowden did especially for Glenn Greenwald how to deal with PGP and set up PGP. You can't expect that. You will miss the leak, you will miss the scoop, you will miss the story. So it's the best interest for every media company and every colleague basically to get some basic information. Uh, having said that, I would uh, actually, on the other hand, um, would warn uh, uh, that I have uh, spoken to, to some senior uh, 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 law enforcement officer from, from the US and um, they were saying actually, yeah, keep on, you know, keep on speaking about encryption and uh, keep on speaking about uh, uh, technology and how important it is to protect your sources. 
there's nothing better for us uh, uh, than a false sense of security when dealing with uh, uh, gadgets and gear. And actually, that's one of the big learnings we had uh, uh, in from the Snowden documents. Uh, you have to keep in mind that they're in XT score. There's this, uh, a special possibility in the menu that you can go for, especially for encrypted traffic from country X, Y, Z. And uh, you can filter it out. And why would you be uh, willing to filter it out if you uh, see no possibility to, to actually crack it right now or perhaps store it and crack it whenever your computers are fast enough. So I would actually uh, um, would uh, think that we have to be creative and not only trust in technology, but uh, you know, use your brains and uh, follow the discussion and perhaps find other ways uh, that are perhaps quite as uh, efficient and especially change patterns. If you're a journalist that never encrypted anything and you would you know, start downloading, ta uh, you know, using Tails, start downloading Tor, uh, beginning to, to, to work with uh, JBoot OTR, I on the other side would say, oh, that's interesting. What's happened here? Uh, what was the contact before that? Uh, so, you know, just be creative. I think we have time for uh, one. Oh, uh, I've got uh, no time. Are you sure? Just one. No time. No time. No time. Um, we have no time. <laughs> it's like the enemy of time. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, thank you so much. We could honestly, we could have talked for an hour and a half. We could have talked for three and a half yeah. hours. <laughs> um, thank you very much indeed to the panel. Thank you. To you and it's three two to West Ham.